Hi AP students, so let's learn about methods of charging. Our starting point or context is this. You have an object that is almost always naturally going to be electrically neutral. We want to look at how can I charge it up. We know the charges are already there somewhere. It's just an issue of uh, creating an imbalance of charges. Either an excess of electrons or a deficit of electrons. Okay, because you can't move protons around. We'll talk more about that. So I'm going to teach you three methods. I will demonstrate these methods in class to make them more visible because some of these are fairly abstract on paper. Hopefully they'll become uh, more clear to you when we show them in class. You are responsible for drawing some of these diagrams to explain what happens with charge in one, two, and three or four steps. So the diagrams to draw are pretty important. Okay, so let's start. So how do we charge an electric neutral object? Well, the most common way that is done, and this is like rubbing a balloon against your hair, if you walk across a carpet in your socks and you get a shock when you touch a doorknob, or even the static generator that we see in class, is called charge by um, contact. Uh, I'm going to stop that. No, I don't like that. Not charge by contact. I'm thinking of something else. My bad. Charge by friction. Okay, and that works not with everything. In fact, it really only works when you rub two or more insulators together. Okay, so when I demonstrate in class, I'll be talking about ebonite. Ebonite is a synthetic type of rubber. So rubber was a classic material used with fur. Uh, the Greeks discovered this two, over 2,000 years ago when they took fur and rubbed it on amber, amber being an insulator. You can do it with glass, plastic, paper to a certain extent. Okay, and an important point is because they're insulators, when you charge something up, the charge stays localized. It does not spread throughout. That will not be true with conductors. So let me draw a picture of this. So let's say this character rubs a balloon against his head, and the balloon becomes charged. So what happened? Well, there was a transfer of charge from one body to another. So let's say the balloon becomes negatively charged. The part that touched this right part will become negatively charged. So I'm just going to indicate that with four arbitrary negatives. And what I'm indicating there is those four negatives indicate above and beyond what's already in there. Remember that balloon has gazillions of charges in it, but they're neutralized by the positive counterparts. So we've added excess charge to the balloon, and therefore where did it come from? Well, it came from the hair of the character here. So if the character lost four negatives, then that means his hair is four positive. So I'm indicating by the arbitrary number four that I have no creation or destruction of charge. I've transferred from one body to another, and it's the electrons that get transferred. That's really, really important. Electrons can move around. The positives are in the protons, and they're anchored in the nuclei. Okay? So a fundamental tenet of this, what we've talked around, is the amount of charge uh, lost by one equals the amount gained by the other. And of course, that's a law of conservation of charge. And in terms of describing why something is negatively charged, it's because it has an excess of electrons. It gained electrons. Whereas a positive charge, the temptation to say is an excess of positives. No. Excess of positives implies that you added positives to it. We did not. We can't move the positives. So it's a deficit of negatives object lost some negative charge so it became positive by default. As to why certain materials gain electrons or lose electrons, that has to do with really the material and how the bonds form within that. We're not going to have to worry about that. Okay, so I'll demonstrate more of that, but that's basically what we see when you rub materials together. You're just simply stripping electrons off one and depositing on the other. The amount gained equal the amount lost. That's charged by friction and works with insulators. The next one is the most common and in some sense um, abstract because it's so obvious that we tend to overlook what's happening. And that's called charge by conduction. And sometimes people call it charge by contact, but contact sometimes people might think of friction, and I don't want to confuse that. And charge by conduction works best with conductors. Okay, in fact, I won't use the word conductors. Generally, conductors are metals. Okay, and the reason they work very well with metals is because they have a sea of mobile electrons uh, 
this after touch goes with that, so just that part. Okay, so electrons are free to move from atom to atom if you give them a push. And so I'm going to talk to you about this. So I'm going to show it to you uh, schematically, then we're going to talk about why it actually happens. So let's look at the before picture here. So I have two spheres. The left sphere is negatively charged. So I'm indicating the negative charge with just uh, extra negatives. And then the right sphere is electrically neutral. In other words, there's no loss of negatives yet, nor are there a gain of negatives. So in conduction, what would have to happen is these would touch. Okay, so it would, conduction occurs simply when a charged object touches another object. That's what happens when we touch a static generator. It gets charged up by friction, if you will. Some mechanism is going on in turn is transferring charge through friction. But when you touch it, you're already a neutral. And so when you touch it, you take on some or all the charge. And so that process is called conduction because it literally happens because you touch the charged object. Friction is when you have two neutral objects and you strip one off one and put on the other. So it's a subtle difference, but it's important. Okay, so here's the before. So what does it look like after they touch and they remain touching? Well, as you can guess, you probably guess, the negatives are going to redistribute. So if I've arbitrarily drawn 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 on here, I'm going to draw 5 on this one and 5 on that one. Okay, so a number of things might be going through your mind. Does it always have to be five and five? Could all of them move to one body? And maybe you're asking, and perhaps the most important question, why do the charges redistribute from all on one object to evenly on the other? So let's answer those questions now. Okay, so what is the mechanism? For most people, they assume it just does so. If the, the charges want to spread out, they say. That's true, they do want to spread out, but that doesn't get to the reason what actually causes them to spread out. They spread out because they're electrons. And what do we know about charges that have the same charge? They're constantly repelling each other. They're exerting forces on each other, so they're repelling. So if they're stuck on this body, they're going to get as far apart as possible. So if I were to represent that sphere better as a circle, I would have the charges on the outside of that sphere. And none would be on the inside, because if they're on the inside, they're going to be closer than they want to be, and they're going to push apart. But if they're surrounded by insulation, namely air and this acrylic base, they have nowhere to go, so they're stuck on that sphere. But if another sphere comes along and touches it, then there is more room for those charges to spread out because of that repulsion, and so they will. So, fill in the blanks. Electrons repel each other and want to get as far away as possible from each other. Next question, will charge flow or excuse me, will charge flow stop when the same amount of charge is on each? The answer is, it depends. Not always the case. In other words, we can't always assume that there's going to be equal amount of charge in both spheres. That is only true if each object or sphere are the same surface area. I could put size there, but surface area is the more accurate way of describing that. Okay. Next, what is grounding all about? So this is something that's probably best demonstrated. So let me discuss what could happen. I can show you. So let's say I charge up the static generator. And the static generator looks like this. The charges, the negative charges are evenly distributed. Grounding means touching that sphere literally to the earth. So the symbol for grounding looks like that. And maybe another one here. So that means I've touched the earth. And I can touch the earth by me touching it and me being connected to the ground. Since the Earth is essentially infinitely larger than that sphere, all the charge will go into that and the sphere will become neutral. Okay? So, if you want to neutralize something, you simply touch it with a much larger object so that the, uh, now you don't want to draw an infinity symbol. Okay, infinite size, so essentially accept all the charge from the smaller body. So, grounding is a way to neutralize an object. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. If I have a positively charged, let me make clear on something. If, if I have a positively charged object, and I touch it to a neutral object, positives don't flow into this. What will happen is the positives will take negatives from here into here, neutralizing it. So if I took two negatives in away, I'm leaving me two negatives there. So becoming positive charged is more subtle, but it works 
uh, in this case because of attraction, whereas the negatives uh, charging something works because of repulsion. Okay, so let's do a quick little example. I've got three identical spheres that are negative three units, positive six units, and positive 15. And we're going to touch all three at the same time. But before we do so, let's ask yourself, what's the overall charge in all three? Well, we simply add them up. Take, take into account positive and negatives, so we would end up with positive 18. All right. If they are brought together in contact, how much charge will be on each? Well, I'm pretty sure you know the answer, but let's make sure we're clear. Afterwards, sigma q, right, prime, after, it's still going to be 18. Charge must be conserved. If I had a total excess or deficit of 18 before, I still have to have that total after. But when you're brought in contact and then separated, we know they're going to redistribute. And since they're the same size, they're going to redistribute such that they're equal amounts, positive 6. Okay, so now let's talk about what was the actual charge flow for the negative 3 sphere. Okay, what was happening and was it going in or out? So what I'm going to draw is three spheres again. And we know, I don't need to draw three, but when these touch, this three went from that state to a positive 6 state. You could argue charge just flowed through this but didn't change anything, so it stayed 6. And then this went from 15 to positive 6. So in a negative 3, how did it go from that? Well, it became more positive. How does one become more positive? Not by gaining positives, because negative 9 flowed into it. No, that's not right. What am I talking about? Negative 9 flowed out of it. Okay, so negative 9 left this, leaving it positive 6, where did it go to? Well, it makes sense. It went to the negative 15. So if negative 9 flowed into this, it became uh, more negative or less positive. So we could also say, right, negative 9 flowed in. Okay. So I'll show you more demonstrations with charge by conduction, hopefully tomorrow. Um, and the last one we're going to talk about is the most abstract. Okay, so I've got two or three minutes left. I might have to continue into another uh, video for this. So let's talk about the third one. And that is called charge by induction. Okay, and the thing about induction, no contact is ever made. If you, if you touch a charged object to another object, that's conduction right away. And the object will take on the same charge as the charging object. A negatively charged object touching a object will make it negatively charged. A positive ob charged object touching another object will make it positive charged. In induction, there's no contact, so it's a little bit different. So to help us understand induction, we're going to first introduce the concept of polarization. So let's look at two objects. i got sphere A and sphere B. A is positively charged, B is neutral. But A is nearby B. Okay? There's an insulating gap between them, air or a vacuum or something else. So what happens? Well, the charges on A will influence the charges that are on B. So wait a second, is it being neutral? It is, but there's charges on the inside. So don't draw this yet, but on the inside you can think of them as paired charges. There's positive and negatives that attract each other. So in essence, they're a happy couple, and they're going to ignore the positive. Well, I shouldn't say that. We're not going to ignore the positive. So if the positive comes near, it's going to do is it's going to pull the negatives to the left side, leaving the positive, the right side positive. And I'm going to just call it equal amounts. So I haven't charged B, but I've polarized it. Okay, that's really, really important. So if I move A away, what happens to B? It goes back to what I was showing before. Those charges come back together and they're evenly distributed throughout. Okay, so I'll show you how we can see polarization without actually charging it. It's kind of cool to see. Now let's use polarization as a way of charging something. So I'm going to stop the video here and then I'm going to pick up and finish the rest of it. Uh, this tutorial, hopefully no more than five minutes for the rest.